Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us, uh, the Capital District Clean Communities Coalition, for our Auto Gas Answers webinar uh, presented uh, in partnership with uh, the Propane Education and Research Council. Um, I'm going to start off. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please, Rachel. Um, let's start off with a few pieces of housekeeping. Just to let everybody know uh, this webinar is being recorded um, and will be posted after the fact, so we can uh, kind of double back and and take a look at what was presented. Um, we'll be posting it on the Clean Communities Coalition website, and I believe uh, Perk will be sending it out as well. Um, just want to let everyone know to. Uh, uh, we're going to wait to answer all the questions at the end of the presentation, uh, but as we're going through, uh, you can uh, enter all and any questions into the uh, questions pod up on the right-hand side of your screen. There should be a drop-down arrow uh, that will allow you to type in questions. Um, quickly go through the agenda for this afternoon. Um, I'm going to be starting off with a quick presentation and overview of the Clean Cities program and uh, background on the Clean Communities Coalition in, in the Capital District. Uh, then I'm going to be passing it off to Steve Whaley from PERC uh, to go into a general overview of propane autogas. Um, next, Derek Whaley from Roush Cleantech will be presenting on the available uh, propane vehicle solutions. Um, and then Matt Meehan from Marabado Fuels and Steve Whaley will be uh, going a little more in depth to the propane infrastructure available. And uh, Amy Selak from Hunters Tannersville Central School District uh, will be giving uh, a presentation on her experience with propane school buses. And finally, I will be uh, wrapping it up with some available funding opportunities in New York State. Next slide, please. Um, so just some background on the Capital District Clean Communities Coalition. Uh, we are hosted by the Capital District Transportation Committee, uh, which is the Metropolitan Planning Organization for New York's Capital District, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on that soon. Um, uh, we were first designated as a Clean Communities Coalition in 1999, so we've been designated by the Department of Energy for over 20 years now. Um, our operating area is kind of the, uh, you know, we'll call it the greater capital district. Uh, we operate within 12 counties uh, in the surrounding area of uh, the city of Albany, um, all the way out to Otsego County in the west, uh, down to Green and Columbia County and up to Warren and Washington County as well. But uh, the majority of the work that we do um, is kind of in that more uh, centralized capital district in uh, Albany, Schenectady, Saratoga, and Rensselaer counties. Uh, and uh, we help, uh, help contribute to uh, over a million gallons of displaced diesel fuel in the region each year. And we'll go over a little bit more how we do that in a couple slides. So next slide, Rachel. Uh, so um, just a quick piece on the uh, the MPO, our host agency, um, the Capital District Transportation Committee. Uh, so we're a, a metropolitan planning organization, which is uh, a federally uh, authorized agency that deals with uh, planning and programming of federal transportation funds. Um, so in all urban areas, over 50,000 people, uh, MPOs uh, are federally mandated and any and all uh, transportation infrastructure that um, uses federal dollars um, is programmed through an MPO. So uh, the MPO itself consists of uh, staff of planners and engineers, and uh, we evaluate projects in the region and um, uh, in turn make recommendations to uh, a committee of municipal planners and engineers and uh, a final board of municipal, uh, local municipal officials that ultimately make the decisions um, on federal transportation funding in the region. Uh, it's a, un a unique setup for the coalition uh, because uh, as the MPO, uh, we have a couple primary federal planning documents and that one of those being the long range transportation plan uh, where we lay out kind of uh, 
priority investment principles uh, for the next 30 years. Um, and then from that plan, uh, we're able to boil down, uh, you know, kind of those broader general policy and goals into an actual uh, transportation improvement program, which is the uh, federally funded uh, five-year capital program of projects for the region. Um, so, and then finally, our, our planning work program is essentially uh, our budget document, which breaks down uh, staff time and, and budgets uh, by individual pieces at the MPO. But uh, how that uh, kind of links back to the Clean Communities Coalition is that we're able to better coordinate um, and kind of insert uh, the priorities of sustainability and alternative and clean fuels into those long range plans uh, that are then going to be kind of adopted and uh, carried through by our municipal members at the local level. Uh, next slide. So what is Clean Cities? Uh, Clean Cities is a U.S. Department of Energy program uh, with the priorities of reducing petroleum consumption uh, across the United States, uh, but really kind of working from a grassroots level um, and working with local public and private fleets uh, across the country to help reduce petroleum consumption, uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and also uh, reduce our dependence on uh, foreign petroleum products. So um, not only do we want to focus on uh, the emissions benefits of alternative fuels, uh, but also really that energy security piece um, in, you know, using uh, uh, local products and, and also, um, having a diverse uh, portfolio of, of fuels in use uh, across the country as well. Next slide. Um, so how we operate, um, our uh, Capital District Clean Communities Coalition is really, uh, a, our, all of our stakeholders are uh, public and private fleets, industry experts um, who are really kind of committed to um, uh, adopting an alternative fuel uh, uh, mindset. And so whether that's uh, fleets that have already started the transition to alternative fuels or uh, interested fleets that maybe don't have any uh, alternative fuels in use, but are really interested in learning more about them and how they can then uh, adopt new alternative fuels and uh, clean fuel technologies. Um, and so as a, being a, a public uh, Clean Communities Coalition. Uh, uh, there are no membership fees. Uh, essentially, uh, stakeholders are uh, able to join the coalition by simply uh, attending a meeting or attending uh, kind of more educational events like this. Uh, our goal is to, to work with all of our stakeholders to help, uh, help them adopt uh, new transportation technologies and, and um, you know, kind of implement the alternative fuel that works best for their fleet. Uh, our primary uh, role as the coalition is is trying to uh, help connect them with, as I mentioned, industry, industry experts, um, as well as uh, perhaps other local fleets or fleets from across the country that have uh, maybe faced the same challenges as them to help them kind of work through those barriers. Uh, next slide. Um, so as I just mentioned, uh, you know, we do have uh, contacts in through the Clean Cities Network uh, across the country. Uh, it is uh, a federal program uh, with nearly 100 coalitions nationwide. And, um, you know, we're able to kind of leverage those resources in this program uh, by uh, tapping on other coordinators throughout the uh, New York State, the Northeast, and across the country. So there are five other uh, clean communities coalitions in New York uh, that we kind of coordinate and talk to on a regular basis, um, and many more throughout the Northeast uh, that we talk to, uh, you know, at least on a monthly basis as well. Uh, so when people or, or stakeholders come to us with questions, um, even if there isn't maybe a, a, an expert or a, a best practice fleet uh, within the capital district, um, it's very easy for us as, as a coalition to reach out and try to get uh, uh, the best information available um, uh, to help along that stakeholder uh, from information from across the country. So next slide. 
Um, as a coalition, we are, uh, you know, we, you know, the program by design is fuel neutral, fuel and technology neutral. So, um, although we're we're here to speak about propane and its benefits today, um, uh, the Clean Communities Coalition does uh, provide education and outreach on a variety of alternative fuels, uh, ele electric, biodiesel, uh, natural gas, as well as propane, um, and so. Um, we are not uh, fuel specific nor technology specific. So uh, we really want to work with uh, each individual stakeholder or fleet uh, to identify uh, the right fuel for them. Uh, and, you know, a lot of that depends on uh, their fleet makeup, uh, whether or not they're light duty, medium duty, heavy duty vehicles, uh, maybe potentially the, the incentives available at any given time. Um, so you know, really, we always just want to point out that we are fuel neutral. Um, and want to promote um, all alternative fuels um, in any way possible and, and really kind of make that fleet uh, specific um, as far as uh, what the best fit is. Next slide. Um, so in, in terms of exactly what we do, I've kind of already mentioned this a handful of times. So really we want to connect our, our stakeholder fleets uh, with our industry experts uh, like folks on the call today. Uh, we also provide a lot of training and information sessions. Um, you know, in, in years past, uh, that's a lot of kind of in-person events that we would host at our offices uh, or potentially, uh, you know, tabling events at um, kind of already local farmers markets or municipal events uh, where we could hand out information on a particular fuel. Um, and, you know, a lot of that also would be technical assistance. So if there's uh, a fleet out there that's interested and maybe doesn't know where to start on uh, the transition process to a new fuel, um, you know, we can help them kind of run through their uh, existing fleet makeup um, and uh, identify the vehicles out there that might uh, be best to transition uh, to an alternative fuel. Uh, in addition to that, all of that, uh, we also do some data collection uh, for the region uh, to keep tabs on the alternative fuel use and greenhouse gas emissions reductions for the capital district and, and publish that annually as well. Um, next slide. And so this is uh, just to kind of wrap up. These are a few of the um, kind of specific events that we've done in the past. Um, you know, uh, again, the past year has been uh, very difficult as it is as it's been for everyone. So uh, the the usual ride and drive events where we like to get fleet uh, uh, fleets kind of in person to to check out a new technology that maybe they haven't had a chance to before. All of that, excuse me, has kind of been put on hold. So we've really focused on virtual events. Uh, but in in years past, um, you'll see down at the bottom in in 2018, we worked with. Um, uh, municipal emergency management fleets uh, uh, to help kind of go through the benefits of having alternative fuels and emergency management vehicles and kind of the resiliency that that provides. Um, 2019, we had a similar workshop uh, to this one today to, to highlight the benefits of, of propane auto gas, and that was an in-person event. Um, and then last year, we had a, a number of kind of virtual events, but one of those being uh, a virtual workshop where we work directly with local municipalities to um, help provide them some guidance on uh, zoning and building codes that could help facilitate the adoption of light duty electric vehicles in their particular municipality. So uh, as a coalition, we work in kind of a variety of ways, uh, both at the technical level directly with fleets or at kind of a more regional and educational uh, and outreach level. Um, but really just wanted to pr provide that uh, kind of overview as who we are as a coalition and what we can provide our stakeholders and potentially anyone on the call today. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to pass it over to Steve uh, to kind of get into the nitty gritty on what we're here to talk about today and, and go over the, the highlights of propane. Jacob, thank you. And I, I really appreciate the, uh, the disposition that the Clean Cities um, take with the all of the above because there is uh, there is no one solution that's going to fit all of our transportation uh, needs um, you know we have a sweet spot electricity has a sweet spot natural gas has a sweet spot biodiesel I mean even you know with with the coming you know uh, fuel cell technologies that are uh, you know a little ways away but still they're you know 
all of the above is, is what I really appreciate about what you guys are doing and helping people fit, you know, what fuel is going to actually fit their duty cycles and, and make sense for them. Uh, not just sense in the, in the, in the dollars and cents, because it does have to be cheaper, but it, uh, it has to make sustainable environmental sense as well. And it seems like a lifetime ago that I was with you at an in-person event uh, back back in 2019 up at your way, and that just seems like, uh, oh my goodness, a lot has happened. It was a different world then. <laughs> it, was, it was, and you were just coming on board as uh, as, as the new director as well. So yep. congratulations on what you've been able to done this year. And, Thank you. Uh, in spite of all of the obstacles. But hey, I am uh, uh, Steve, Steve Whaley with the Propane Education Resource Council. I'm delighted to, to be here. Um, we're going to go through a rapid fire of, uh, of a lot of images and slides, mostly to provoke you to think about submitting those questions. Okay, uh, so I, I, I do reside in South Carolina, uh, which is considered the, the, the South, but I've never been accused of talking slow. Uh, so I am going to go really fast. It's recorded. We'll have other things and uh, something piques your interest. Just write it down, put it in the questions, and we'll make sure that we get to it. So, so you want to do an alternative energy adoption project, okay? Or at least you think you do, or someone's telling you that you need to do that. So what is it, what does success look like for, for those who want to, to make this happen? Um, well, <clears throat> four criteria have to be there. It has to be cleaner than what we're using today. It has to be cheaper than what we're using today. It has to perform just as well and drive just as far. And we have to have a lot of it. If, if, if all four of those don't exist, we're only going to make little dents in this, uh, uh, you know, diesel and gasoline, you know, world that we live in. So how does propane line up with all of that? Well, we're the most cost-effective solution for reducing tailpipe emissions that are the worst, which is nitrogen oxides. We'll get into a little bit of that in a little bit. Uh, we have the lowest total cost of ownership of any fuel, gasoline, diesel, anything that's out there, alternative or not. Uh, our performance on horsepower torque is just as good as what we're doing in diesel and, and gasoline. And we do that without compromising on how far you drive as well. And my favorite, of course, is the last because I'm with the Propane Education Research Council. So we like to track gallons of propane. And we produced 28 billion gallons. We did more than anybody else in the entire world. And we used 9 billion gallons of it here domestically, and we sent nearly 20 billion gallons overseas. Now, I would like to see everybody on this particular call help me make a dent in that 19 billion gallons that's going overseas. So if we all step up and start using more of our domestic energy here that's super clean, uh, we can reduce those exports and keep a little bit more of it here and do, do a world of good for, for our own country. So what is propane? Well, it's the exact same fuel that's out on your back patio, fuel in your uh, grill that allows you to cook and, and, and it's so clean we let it touch our food. Um, <clears throat> but it's used in a host of varieties, uh, heating homes, millions of homes. We're in agricultural farms and irrigation system uh, pumps. We're in forklifts. I mean, we were in forklifts decades and decades and decades ago, even before, you know, the EPA was, is, is, was in existence and we were regulating any kind of emissions because it was just common sense that propane was so clean, we would put it in a forklift inside a warehouse because if we use gasoline and diesel, you know, people got sick and died. Um, but propane has been super clean. We're doing it commercial mowers everywhere. So I'm having a little difficulty moving my slides, Rachel, so thank you for doing them for me. I, I, I can't get that arrow direction to, to seem to work very well. Um, but we have two sources of, of propane. We have an organic source where the vast majority of it comes from, and it's from nat natural gas processing. So uh, not, not far from where you are at, uh, the Marcellus uh, uh, Shale, we have a ton of propane uh, right, right under your feet. That's where most of it comes from. But we also have renewable sources that are coming online now too. And we'll get a little bit more into that at the very end when we start doing some carbon footprint comparisons. But both of them, 
behave exactly the same way, the same molecular structure, same performance, and they're non-toxic. It can't contaminate the air. You can't spill it into any soil or water sources. And that's why the EPA doesn't even regulate those tanks that are storing propane, because you don't, like, unlike gasoline and diesel, you can't seep it into the ground, okay? It just, it just can't happen. You have to help me out, Rachel. There you go. Okay, so why are fleets doing this? Now, I can tell you all of these reasons, but we're going to have other people on this call that are going to help with that, uh, especially my favorite one, Amy. Thank you very much, Amy, for, <clears throat> for being here. Um, and, and we always save the best for last, so she, she's going to go last. But it's it's cheaper. We have lower emissions. And, you know, not many people know, but it's a whole lot quieter. Um, and I'll, I'll let Amy talk about uh, drivers now being able to hear what students are saying about them while they're driving down the road. Uh, less maintenance time. Uh, Derek's going to cover that pretty well. Um, corporate image. Let's, 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 let's not discount, you know, hey, this makes us look good when we're actually saving money and saving the environment. And I'll let Amy talk a little bit more about uh, employee retention and, uh, and driver morale. So we'll move on to the next one. All right, so everybody has a path to zero. Um, although none of us have gotten there yet, um, you know, there's no such thing as a zero emission vehicle because, uh, I mean, even the brake pads are emitting particulate matter as well as tires rolling down the road. Uh, but as far as tailpipe emissions, um, some of us have it right at the tailpipe, some of us have it at the power plant. Um, but there is emissions that going uh, out from, from all of our vehicles. But every single one of us, of all the energy sources that Jacob's been talking about, are pursuing getting as close to zero as we possibly can. All right, so how has propane's path to zero been? Uh, uh, we started off really well with particulate matter. We're a very clean fuel, so we don't have the particulate matter filters that go onto vehicles like diesel for, for removing that. Uh, the NOx emissions is one I am most proud of uh, because although everybody, diesel, gasoline, propane, CNG, everybody has to have an EPA or CARB certification that says you're clean enough to drive down the road, even with the best in class clean diesel compared to the best in class propane, we are 96% cleaner than that clean diesel. This was done by an independent West Virginia University, the same people that busted Volkswagen about you know, doing their, their scandal with emissions. So they're, they're pretty persnickety about making sure their data is right. They did a mobile test of two buses going down the road, exactly the same, one on diesel and one on propane. And that's where they came up with that 96% less NOx emissions uh, for, 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 for propane. We're also getting much better in greenhouse gases. We're going to talk about that with some new technologies, as well as what we're doing uh, with renewables. So fuel and maintenance costs, we're gonna go right to the next slide. Um, the blue line here shows over a longer period of time, we have been consistently less expensive than gasoline and diesel. And in the next slide, <clears throat> Uh, gives you somewhat of a geographic breakdown. This is uh, some December numbers. I do need to get these updated just a bit, uh, but it gives you an idea of, of what kind of pricing it is compared to gasoline and diesel. All right, so very good. Uh, Derek's going to cover the uh, the diesel we know today and how how uh, the the buses are removing all of this equipment. So we'll go to the next slide, and the next slide is going to talk about what we can do with propane. Now we, we can go on virtually anything that runs with a spark plug, we can run on propane, but there's a sweet spot. You know, we can do some, you know, passenger vehicles and it, and it works out pretty well. Um, but mostly we've been doing that class three through seven range and school buses fall into that class seven range. And so <clears throat> let's go to the next slide and we'll see exactly how uh, uh, these things are being made. We have quite a few, different solution providers. Uh, we have Roush with us on the phone today, but there's quite a few others out there that are providing vehicles that operate on propane. And uh, like I said, Roush is, is one of them and they have their lineup here. Derek's gonna cover that. So we'll go right to the next one and we'll, we'll announce these. We'll go through these quickly. The Freightliner is another one where we can do class six and seven vehicles. And we can also do uh, Greencraft out of California. They're one of, uh, of three now that offer um, uh, 0.02 ultra low NOx uh, along with uh, PSI and Roush. Uh, Alliance Autogas is an aftermarket biofuel system. Uh, 
This allows you to take existing gasoline vehicles uh, that you already have in your fleet. You don't have to wait to, to, to come around and buy, buy new ones uh, that, that come from the factory on propane, but you can actually convert existing gasoline vehicles that you have and get started you know, even much quicker. ICOM uh, does the same thing with an aftermarket solution to put on your mid-duty trucks and vans uh, to make it run on propane tomorrow if you, if you need to. Campbell Parnell, I believe, is the last one, <clears throat> and uh, they focus their certifications on one platform. That's the Isuzu cab over, and they do it very well. Uh, LKQ is one of the largest uh, uh, auto manufacturing recycling parts in the world, and they've committed to do all 4,000 of their vehicles on, on propane. They're doing it across the country now. So let's move into the most popular vehicle platform that propane has today and that is school buses and school transportation. Uh, we have three uh, major school bus manufacturers and all three of them have propane options on their school buses. And when we take a look at how we're doing today with how many we have, we are on <clears throat> in 1,000 school districts and we are moving uh, one and a quarter million students when all those school districts are open. <laughs> Uh, and we have 22,000 propane powered school buses around these United States now. Uh, it is the, uh, the, the fastest growing alternative energy that there is out there. And we can compare this to some reasons why. One of those reasons is, is, is a cost factor. If we take, and I'll pick on Bluebird here because they offer all four solutions. If we take a, a, a basically a $100,000 uh, diesel bus, you know, it's equipped exactly the same way and spec'd out for your particular state and district, uh, the, the propane upfit charge, the incremental cost as we like to say, it averages about six or $7,000 over that diesel bus. CNG is about 35% more, uh, but you can see on the electric side, we, we, we have to reach a little bit deeper into the pocket to be able to make this, this happen. Uh, another way to look at that is we can go in a cost per mile uh, scenario. So in a, in a cost per mile, we're, we're looking at in this next slide, is uh, uh, taking the energy cost of each of those fuels along with the, the price of the bus and spreading it out over a 15,000 uh, mile uh, uh, per year with um, average national fuel prices. And I'll, I'll, I'll put the national uh, kilowatt hour electricity at, at, at 13 cents uh, a kilowatt hour. And when you do that, you get an actual cost per mile and, and we just shine the best. It, uh, it's, it's very cost effective. And that's one of the reasons why we have so many of them out there today. When we look at the Volkswagen settlement monies um, uh, to date, as of January 31st, you can see how right side up the equation is for propane buses. Um, the blue area is the amount of money that's been spent uh, awarding you know, uh, grants to, to help you know, buy, buy new buses. And then the yellow area is actually the number of uh, buses that were able to be deployed uh, with those funds. And so we, we really, really like our, uh, our economics for, for making propane work. Just to do a little bit of comparison here, we'll, we'll pick on two states, California and Texas. Um, both of them have spent a good amount of money trying to reduce nitrogen oxides, okay? So over the last 15 years, California has invested $816 million, and they've been able to remove 35,000 tons of that bad stuff, uh, nitrogen oxide, which is the worst for respiratory illness and everything else. Well, how come Texas has spent significantly less, $561 million, but they've almost doubled the amount of NOx emissions reduced in their state? Now, how did they do that? Well, if, if you look a little bit deeper, uh, Texas, like Jacob had talked about with the DOE Clean Cities Coalitions, is more fuel neutral. They, they put the best solution in for that particular fleet. And quite frankly, California has a much narrower view of trying to electrify everything. And when you do that and you look at your money spent and how much you can actually reduce, um, uh, Texas is shining a little bit brighter. So uh, we'll go on to the next slide. 
And we're going to look at three market segments real quick that will show what's going to be just as good as, uh, as school buses here uh, coming up and, uh, and moving into the future. And they all have something in common. It's that class three through seven weight class. They're, they're, these, these folks are using some fuel, okay? They're heavier vehicles and they're going further on regional routes, not just, you know, around the block. Um, and those three markets are, the first one is food and beverage. Uh, the delivery of food and beverage is coming on very strong. Uh, everybody knows about Schwann's. They have over 4,000 propane vehicles uh, delivering uh, food to, to people's home. Um, Nestle Waters has now over a thousand of their trucks delivering water um, all around. And that's just been in the last five years since they've adopted that. Our next uh, segment is actually the paratransit. Um, these in every single county in these United States, uh, to, to conform with the American with Disabilities Act, everybody has shuttle buses that are equipped to, to, to take folks where they need to go. Unlike the, the, the big transit buses that are on a fixed route, these are all point to point. So we have about 25,000 of these paratransit vehicles that are in that uh, uh, van and cutaway uh, scenario that are eligible to run on propane. Um, and they use a lot. They use about twice as much fuel as a school bus does. And if you know, you know, hey, we're, we're saving, you know, X amount per, per gallon, the more gallons you use, the more that you're going to save. Uh, so this is a great market. That we have over 7,000 paratransits now operating on propane around the country. The last segment here is the package and, uh, oh, I I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I put in a, a new slide that I forgot I had put in there because I just got some numbers from a paratransit that had put some vehicles out for, for bid. And, uh, and it shows, you know, the exact same 14 passenger shuttle bus with two wheelchair access and so forth. Um, you know, the, the, the gasoline version at 71, the, the propane version at 86, and the electric version at 233, just in case you're keeping score. Um, just wanted to throw that, throw that out there. And, and what we can do. The last one is a parcel package. Now, my favorite of all these, everybody knows UPS and FedEx and DHL and all their uh, uh, adoption of, of, of propane, but my favorite new one is actually the independent contractors that move mail for the United States Postal Service. Of the 92,000 routes that the Postal Service has, 70,000 of those routes are done by independent contractors who own their own trucks, buy their own fuel, and have to get from one distribution center for the post office to another, another hub to another hub. They have about 10,000 class six and seven box trucks like you see in the picture here. And these folks are doing great. They're going through a thousand gallons of fuel a month. And when they get locked in at a great rate for propane on a three year contract, even when diesel goes up like it has for the last 17 weeks in a row now, they are locked in at the same price to be able to manage their uh, operational cost over three years. It's a really good application there. So with that, I think that's the last one, Rachel, if you can go on to the next one. Oh, sorry, forgive me. We're, we're not stopping there. Um, we are moving ahead. Uh, we are developing new engines and our last partnership has actually been with Cummins in taking their 6.7 liter block and doing a purpose-built propane engine from the ground up. The stats on this, as you can see in the next slide, are really good. My favorite one is the compression ratios that we're able to get back up to 12 to 1 compression ratios and with that we're able to produce a tremendous amount of power on this next torque curve. We can see the black line at the very top of this torque curve shows where diesel is. And uh, uh, you can see how much better it is than, than gasoline and, and some of the other propane engines we have. But look at the green line on top of that black line. That green line, we are 375 horsepower and 880 foot-pounds of torque. We're better than diesel is operating on propane. So we're super excited about this and the, uh, the projections for commercialization now are coming up in Q3 of 2024 uh, is, is the release date of this. So we're super excited about uh, getting more of these in the heavier class seven. And because of those combustion efficiencies and uh, additional uh, uh, brake thermal um, uh, matching of diesel, we're able to reduce CO2 at the tailpipe emissions substantially here. So, 
that's what we've been doing with technology. What have we been doing with the actual fuel? Um, our future is in renewable propane. As I mentioned before, the vast majority of it comes from natural gas processing. But now, as we're doing more renewable jet fuels, renewable diesels, all of this, we have another byproduct, and that is renewable propane. Super low carbon intensity, um, comes from very inexpensive feeds, like the fats and oils and so forth that we're doing. We have a lot of it. My favorite part is the low energy conversion. Now, what this means is, in, in some building of renewables, you put in, you know, 10x energy to get 1x amount of energy out of it and since we're a byproduct of something else already being made you know we're repurposing and reusing it so it has you know virtually no energy conversion cost to make this happen uh and it's very competitively priced so <clears throat> with that we'll go to the next slide that shows uh, our two sources. Uh, renewable diesel, REG down in Louisiana is the biggest one that's out there right now, but a lot more are coming online. Uh, they're producing about 5 million gallons a year. Uh, the other source is when we do a blend. Um, uh, dimethyl ethyl is being created now from uh, cow manure. And in uh, Southern California, Oberon's doing this probably more than, than anybody right now. And uh, they take 20% of this fuel, which has a negative 278 carbon intensity, and we blend it with 20% of DME and 80% regular propane, and we get a carbon intensity of 11. Uh, it is super, super clean. And so what we can do with that in the next slide is do a greenhouse gas life cycle analysis okay so you know it's it's, it's easy to beat up on diesel these days uh, but we're all being measured to what is uh in an electric vehicle because you know the the, the perception is an electric vehicle has no no emissions and i think we've kind of covered a little bit of that but let's look at greenhouse gas and we're going to do a comparison to, to EV because that seems uh, to, to be the closest standard. So what is EV? We, we have an electric grid that has lots of sources of energy going into it. We, you can see the states here that are the darker red. That's the coal being put onto the grid, uh, power plants, um, the natural gas over here. Uh, the next slide is actually going to show more of the renewable side of what's going into the grid. Uh, we have a few states that are doing nuclear. Uh, my home state of South Carolina has over 50% of its electric grid on nuclear, so it has a very low carbon footprint. Hydro of the Pacific Northwest is real popular. We have uh, solar, of course, in California and Nevada and wind coming up through the middle states but when we combine all of those things together we have a carbon intensity our measuring stick if you will with propane uh, at an average nationwide at 79 that carbon intensity is what we use to calculate the amount of co2 that's going to be in the process that we apply it to the grid electricity on the national scale and you can see every state is just a little bit different but on the the, the national average for grid electricity is 165 so with that, when we start using renewable propane, uh, let's measure the amount of CO2 one electric truck and one propane truck would, would operate in. Uh, this next slide will you know, give you just a little bit more background on how we get to that um, megajoules of you know, uh, carbon intensity from, from the electric grid. We have the extraction of the sources that go into the generation power plants, the transmission lines, and then the amount that actually uh, CO2 that's generated in charging uh, batteries for making that happen. So let's go to the map and we're going to do a comparison of renewable propane being compared to the electric grid. Okay, we're taking those carbon intensities for each state, and we're going to say, we're going to drive a medium duty truck 60,000 miles a year, and we're going to measure how much CO2 that electric truck is going to com do compared to the propane truck. Um, with, with our renewable propane. Uh, pick on California, for example. Um, we're going to be, uh, with propane, 131 tons of CO2 less than the electric truck being charged on the grid in California. Let's look at New York. Uh, in New York, if we were to use renewable propane in a medium duty truck, uh, it's going to be 120 tons better. If we use the DME blend, it's 174 tons better. Uh, but if we do our very best recipe of renewable propane blended with DME, 
you can see the numbers get astounding in this next slide. Um, and it'll be for the state of New York, we'll see it at 353 tons of CO2 less. Now, can, can I blend this today? Yes, I can blend it today. Can I produce enough of it today for all the vehicles in the United States? Not yet, okay, but it can be done. Now, we're also cleaning up the electric grid. So if we, if we say in 2035, we can clean up the electric grid 95% cleaner. So 95% of it is all renewable energy going to the grid. And we can do a battery that's five times better than it is today. Right now we're at about a 1000 cycle battery. In 2035, I'm gonna say we can do a 5000 cycle battery. These next numbers here show, if you go to the next slide, if we do the best electric grid of 2035 and we do the best recipe of renewable propane in the state of New York, we're still 67 tons of CO2 less than what the electric grid is gonna do. So it's not just a bridge fuel, it's not just a temporary fuel, we are a fuel for the future as well. And we can be scalable all along the way in doing that. So quick summary, uh, next slide, and then we're gonna go straight over to Ralph. I, I put this in here because this is being recorded so you can stop on the recording and get all of the sources for measuring the math for those CO2 emissions. And the next slide will be a, a, a summary and it'll just, Couple of the benefits, three areas here, cost effectiveness. We average about 15% of the vehicle costs. To make that same vehicle operate on propane is about 15%. Uh, we have no range issues. We can go you know, 300, even some school buses, 400 miles without uh, having to uh, you know, um, um, be diminished by turning on the air conditioner or heat. Um, and you, you've seen the emission numbers that I've been able to present. The one thing I didn't do was NOx emissions, and uh, I haven't done this for all 50 states, but in California, they asked me to do this. So um, the NOx emissions for the electric vehicle driving one mile is 0.83 grams per mile, and that same regular old propane is 0.44 grams per mile. So even on the NOx emissions, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're measuring up quite well. So Jacob, thank you. Um, we'll, we'll go on to uh, the, the next presenter and I'll let you introduce uh, whoever it is from Roush that we have today. Yeah, thanks, Steve. That was great. Um, and yep, so next up we have Derek Whaley from Roush Cleantech Fuels uh, to go a little bit more in depth on uh, what type of vehicles are out there today. Uh, Derek? Yes, sir. All yours. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it very much. Hey, everybody. Uh, happy Tuesday, I think is where we're at. Um, so what I'm going to do is do a real quick run through. I'm going to keep it to about 10, 12 minutes uh, to kind of do story time, where we've been, where we're going, and then really tee it up for Amy, who is what we uh, we really want to hear from. So, uh, Steve, I hate following you. Um, and by the way, parsicony, I had to Google that word, did not know what that was or what it meant. Bravo, now I have a new word of the day. Um, and Jacob, uh, thank you again for taking the torch and uh, couldn't say it better. There's no, uh, there's no silver bullet. You know, we need all the fuels to help bring, uh, bring this emission world down. And, you know, today I'm gonna talk about commercial and uh, really school bus is my, my passion personally, because you look at the height of these kids, you look at what coming out the tailpipe and you look at, you know, what we wanna be and be about, you know, and it's improving their quality of life, their health and their safety, getting them to and from school. And really there's, not, not else you can get more fired up about that. So um, we can dive right in, Rachel. You can go to the next uh, next slide. So here's our scorecard where we've been. Uh, Roush Clean Tech uh, is a, a division of Roush Enterprises. Roush is about 4,000 employees around the world, about 70 facilities. We do engineering for everybody and, and really anybody. Um, we work with different companies in aerospace, uh, doing rocket propulsion technology. We work with Google, self-driving vehicles. Uh, we work with a variety of uh, OEMs on their electric powertrain integration. Um, engineer roller coaster rides for a lot of the uh, entertainment, the big names. Um, and work with a lot of Department of Defense contracts as well. So if you can think about engineering it, we've probably uh, probably done it. Uh, but when it comes to Roush Clean Tech, this is Jack Roush's real passion. It's going to be his legacy uh, because we're combining uh, true sustainability from environmental and economic and applying it to both to better private and public fleets all across North America. Uh, and where we're at after 10 years is 37,000 vehicles that are on the road with over a billion miles. Uh, and we're on generation five. So 
So what's, uh, when someone asked Thomas Edison, hey, how'd you do the light bulb? He goes, hey, let me tell you like a thousand ways not to do a light bulb, right? So we're always learning, we're always innovating, and we're always getting better and sharper and cleaner. Uh, and we're currently working with over 2,500 fleets, whether that's a parcel truck on the left and the F-strip chassis all the way over the glorious, magnificent Bluebird uh, Vision bus running on propane. You go to the next slide, Rachel. So just to give you a little bit of an idea, there's a lot of different technology manufacturers that are out there. Uh, we started with a lot of people in the swimming pool. There's only a handful left. Um, so when I talk about this, uh, it's not, not to beat our chest. It's really to prove a point of a partnership. Um, there's been some OEMs in certain spaces, I'll pick on school bus, that have had four technology manufacturers in the past five years, right? Now, what we want to push on from a Roush Ford Bluebird uh, perspective is, okay, we want to simplify your life, right? We want to keep common engine transmission, powertrain warranty parts on your type A or type C buses the same on the shelf. Uh, this manufacturer here, this manufacturer here, well, we just did this, let's go here. Well, so we want to keep it as smooth as we possibly can with commonality. Um, and that translates even to, to your white fleet. So a lot of school districts now that our fleet runs on propane are buying dump bodies, they're buying salt spreaders, they're buying uh, transportation shuttles, um, all running on propane now, and they can do that through a Ford Motor Company. So so Roush is one of really two companies in the world that has a QVM and a QCM status, qualified vehicle modifier and qualified um, calibration modifier. So really we can recalibrate Ford's engine with their permission uh, to run and optimize on whatever fuel we want to, uh, whether it's our electric, battery electric truck, whether it's our propane auto gas school bus, uh, you fill in the blank. So uh, whether you order a vehicle with XYZ modifications, you put in a couple ship throughs, and just like if it was being built on gasoline or diesel, boom, that's delivered to you exactly the same way, except it's running on propane auto gas. Because um, the warranty part is incredibly uh, uh, important to us. It's not just about if we want to take you know, a, a page out of the Poconos or the uh, Watkins Glen Raceway, right? You can build a great car, great engine, race, but when that thing gets in the pit crew, you need to be able to get it up and back on the road as quickly as possible. Uh, so we just don't just want to make a great product. We want to create something that's going to channel an OEM network. You can go to the next slide, Rachel. So this is my passion. I love it. I, I, I love all of them. But to be honest, uh, this vertical market is so exciting. I never thought this shade of yellow would get me so, if, I mean, about eight years now I've been in, in this role with Roush and uh, the school bus industry is phenomenal. Um, you gain so much respect for people that run the transportation, uh, drivers, technicians, uh, management. I mean, it really is quite a beautiful uh, privilege in this country that we have and uh, we're honored to be a part of it. So with Bluebird, uh, really we were running parallel. Bluebird was over here running and Roush was over here running with Ford um, and what Bluebird was doing, and you gotta give them credit, they only built a school bus, right? So back in the early 2000s, they saw what was starting to happen with uh, tailpipe emissions and EPA and CARB and things were getting more stringent. And with that, they said, okay, Let's start looking and seeing the writing on the wall. Now we weren't their first, you know, marriage, right? But but we have renewed our vows up until 2025, and I'm sure we'll extend them uh, again. And this is what we've been able to do, right? So in 2012, February was the first propane bus we put on the road, okay? And Ford, Bluebird, Roush, we all said if we can get a couple hundred a year maybe over time we can start changing this because if you if you sit yourself in a transportation director's shoes i'm coming in saying hey try propane it's like okay you know calm down derek i'm um, look you're looking at changing an engine that's a big deal transmission really big deal great transmission allison's great you're looking at changing a fuel that's been proven in an industry for 20 years right and in some cases right i'm asking you to change a body manufacturer uh, for a school bus those are big hurdles right so we we want to respect that and and can combat those each head on and we'll go with that a little bit later uh, but we also want to have you know a patience and we blinked and now here we are 2020 Bluebird's alternative portfolio with Roush is now over 50%. At 2020, 54% of everything that Bluebird built came out with a Roush Ford engine in it. So it's changed the automotive industry and the school bus application um, forever. And now Bluebird is the only one that offers everything, electric, propane, CNG, gasoline, diesel. Um, and as you can see, it's clearly favoring and leaning towards another way. And that's because of the industry. It's because of Amy and the Amy's out there in the world that are really saying, hey, there's a clean, more cost-effective um, 
solution that really does well in cold weather um, and improves the quality of life for the drivers. So we'll get into that. You can go to the next slide, Amy, or um, sorry, Rachel. Um, so here is a popular one that we do for the board meetings. Um, I personally like it. I think it kind of condenses and shows everything from diesel, gas, propane, CNG, and electric, and really where propane fits in that sweet spot. Uh, we per we believe at Roush, um, because we work with all, all fuel alternative fuels, uh, hydrogen fuel cells is one of our most uh, progressive ones that we're getting some real exciting uh, projects going on with that. But we think that in the medium duty space, you know, that class, you know, four, th four through seven, especially the school bus, Propane is just such a beautiful application um, from a, a cost budgeting to ease of adoption to infrastructure to range. I mean, you can see all the, the points on the side. Um, and it's proven time and time again, whether that's uh, in Florida or it's in Alaska, the National, uh, Denali National Park, it's doing well. You can go to the next slide. Here we are. This is one of my favorite slides because uh, we never thought we'd get here so fast, and here we are. And as you can see, most of these birds, and this is individual deployment of, uh, it could be one bus or it could be 500 buses in some cases. Um, all the different uh, uh, deployments, really, if you look at the majority, are all in cold weather climates. And that's a huge myth that we're gonna, you know, put Amy on the spot and see how, how do these birds fly in cold weather um, compared to other, you know, technologies and, and different fuels that are out there. And we do quite, quite well. So it's exciting now to be able to present the education and then say, hey, where are you? Let's talk to some of your peers because we guarantee you they're running them. You can go to the next slide, Rachel. Here is the uh, the beautiful Bluebird vision. Um, on the propane side, we have uh, 300 miles or a standard tank and over 400 miles uh, on the extended range tank um, that are currently. And then with the new engine, we're actually excited to see some improved fuel economy and uh, seeing what that data comes back with too. So we're only gonna get a little bit more efficient. You can go to the next slide. Um, for non-school bus deployments, uh, a lot of people just think it's it's just a yellow world, and for me, a lot of the time it is. I love it, but um, we also do a great deal in municipalities. Uh, parcel, like Steve had talked about earlier, uh, towing, uh, airport shuttles, um, you, and I'll show you some pictures here in a little bit, but just like our, our school bus, we have deployments all over North America, Hawaii, and Alaska, uh, and it's proving and, and doing quite, quite well. You can go to the next slide. Just give an example, and Rachel, we'll, we'll bounce through these pretty quick. Paratransit after school bus is probably the, the most adopting. Um, DART actually in Delaware, after this year, all 300 of their paratransit E450 shuttle buses will be uh, um, on propane. So they will be the first paratransit actually in the country that'll be 100% alternative fuel. And they're saving well over a million dollars a year just in fuel, not even counting the maintenance costs on top of that. Same with San Diego as well. Um, a lot of people think California is only for, for an EV, uh, but we can assure you that it's not. Um, we, we think that EV does great in some areas, but really in the range uh, areas of, of a medium duty application, uh, school bus and paratransit are still leading the way by far. You can go to the next slide. Um, we also have uh, this uh, from the microbird standpoint. We don't want to leave out microbird. Um, so, so through New York Bus Sales, who is our dealer in the upstate New York, and they've actually successfully done more individual deployments, I think, than any other dealer in the country uh, when it comes to alternative fuel deployments uh, within Bluebird. So always pushing the edge, educating, and having demos and resources for school districts to make the right decision for their fleet. Um, the nice thing is, is if you see that microbird propane in the top right corner, that has the exact same engine powertrain that the type C bus has. So you talk about you know your 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 tech mechanic and part serviceability. How great is it to have the exact same powertrain by a little company called Ford Motor Company that everyone knows, right? Um, on the shelf to be able to to keep things uh, timely and available and on the road. You can go to the next slide. Um, like Steve said, the parcel service and USPS is really ramping up now. For the first time, they've put it in literature. The USPS is saying, hey, we, we want you to go green. EV, propane, CNG, let's do it. Uh, so it's nice to see you know, these starting to run around more and more all over the, uh, the country and reducing a lot of emissions. And you can blast through these uh, next four slides pretty quick. Nestle, uh, LA Airport has scissor lifts for catering companies, uh, tree companies, uh, Acadia National Park. Uh, Meripride Trolley Services, Laguna Beach runs a lot of these. Um, and really, like I said, new engine and Gen 5. We're not slowing down. We're, we're going to keep on going uh, because every time we come out with a new generation, it's better starting, it's better emissions. And you can go through this, uh, Rachel, next slide. 
um, improved torque and improved horsepower while reducing emissions. Uh, Ford has really expanded what they're going to be doing with this new engine, uh, leaner, meaner, and cleaner. Um, they're putting it from the F-250 all the way up to the F-750. So Ford is actually going to be putting this engine in, as you can see, in more vehicle applications than even its predecessor uh, was. And a uh, little, little shock is we're competitive at Roush. Um, we're doing 600 engines. Actually, Ford will be able to do 1,000 engines a day, 1,000 engines a day um, now that we're past this COVID year uh, when it comes to a building application. Nobody else can touch that in the alternative you know, fuel space when it comes to, to really anybody, but school buses in particular. Um, as you can see here, uh, we're about 70% cleaner if you combine everything. Uh, same with Steve, I'm passionate about NOx because once you start looking into the, uh, what comes out and what NOx emissions dung does to uh, human lung health, especially for small children and their development, uh, it's pretty catastrophic consequences. So limiting that and getting it to as close to zero as we possibly can is huge. Um, so, but if you combine everything else, we're about 70%. And here, this is what's starting to come out in Europe, but especially the first one of its kind came out of Georgia State University, where they actually have evidence where they can tie improved academic performance and really behavioral importance, which you know, one kind of goes hand in hand, uh, when they're riding a low NOx engine. You can go to the next slide. All right, cost and complexity. I'm going to breeze through these pretty quick, too. Uh, this is really where it comes important. Like I said earlier, commonality is huge. Um, so on the on the engine with, with Roush and Ford, fluid spark plugs, parts, uh, software, it's just as if Ford did it themselves. The only thing you got to do is every 50,000 miles change a fuel filter, right? Um, on top of that, we're limiting the uh, preventative maintenance. So eight quarts of oil versus 17 to 30 on diesel. That adds up, especially for large fleets. You can go to the next slide, Rachel. Um, about $200 savings on the preventative maintenance when you combine it. But the next slide actually shows an even wider gap, okay, where we can factor in all of the different uh, after treatment that's on diesels that we know today, charged air coolers, turbos, um, uh, 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 different uh, knock sensors, um, um, hose requirements. I mean, all of these, if, if it comes off or fails, that's a part, even under warranty, that's a bust down. And a bust down is, is not really something that we can afford with ever constricting budgets, uh, especially after the year we had. You can go to the next slide, Rachel. When you look at the cost associated, this really stood out to me when I did all the numbers, over $21,000, and this is today, this is not including the 2024 or 2027 EPA and CARB uh, federal uh, standards that they're actually gonna be getting stricter and tighter. We actually meet 2027 today, and we don't have to add any of this on top of it. Now, if you look on a Ford um, uh, side, you go to the next two slides, I think it'll do a little snapshot of, yeah, we won't find these on a Ford Bluebird, um, but the next slide shows 21,000 versus 3,000, right? Much better. And then you go over to actual engine cost replacements and we win there. Um, the, the V8 actually is looking at being even more cost effective than even the, uh, the V10 was because it's gonna be produced at a higher volume of scale. So you look at replacing a Cummins, you look at replacing a PSI, you're looking at replacing a Ford. We win hands down and lead time. We had one district get an engine back up on the road in 10 days at $5,000 because they did a short block and did all this stuff themselves. Um, so pretty incredible that we can do that at such a low cost. Like I said, the future's coming 2027. They're gonna move that decimal point, point over and that's gonna mean a lot of uh, unfortunate things for diesel. You can go to the next slide. Uh, real world savings, you can skip over because we're going to talk to Amy about the uh, the experience of propane. Um, we do offer this, so New York Bus Sales has uh, access to this. We love the consultative approach. Let's sit down, let's look at your fleet, let's run your specific numbers and do a conservative analysis, just the fuel, fluid, and filters, right? Let's not factor in the 21,000 I just talked about. Let's just look at what we're doing. So best case scenario for everything, where does propane stand out? And we haven't we haven't come up negative yet, so we've been uh, doing quite well. Next slide. Here we are. This is it. Simple, robust, no compromise, economical, safe by composition and by design, wells to wheel, pretty clean. Thank you guys very much, and we look forward to questions. Thanks, Derek. That was great, and you know, it's great you pointed on all the. Uh, uh, the the cost efficiencies and and the performance efficiencies and you know also we'll talk about at the end on top of all that there are additional state incentives uh, uh, to kind of 
help offset that that incremental cost um, even more so. So uh, a lot of options out there on the vehicle side of things. I also wanted to um, kind of remind everyone that uh, you know. Uh, don't be shy on asking questions. Feel free to, to add them into the questions uh, pod whenever you'd like uh, throughout the presentation. So that way we can kind of get to them all at the end. Um, so again, don't be shy uh, with the questions. I'm sure uh, all of our panelists this afternoon would be uh, more than happy uh, to answer any questions that come their way. Um, so next, we uh, wanted to move on. Uh, we're going to pass it back over to Steve and um, uh, Matt Meehan from uh, Marabito Fuels will also be presenting on infrastructure side solutions. Terrific. Matt, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, get that camera on so we can we can see your pretty face. Uh, you got it. Thanks, Steve. And get this thing going. We're, we're going to, Matt and I are going to do this together. Um, we, uh, uh, we're going to talk about two, two kinds of infrastructure for, for propane. And uh, uh, the, the, the first part of it is um, uh, the, the different ways that, that fuel can, can get in a vehicle. Um, uh, <clears throat> this isn't the most ideal, but the mobile refueling can happen. Um, the city of Boston does 400 buses every single night with two bobtails with two reels on each one of them uh, to fill up every single one of those. But they're in a unique situation. They have no room for, you know, uh, even back when they were doing diesel, they didn't have a diesel. They had the wet hose as well. Um, but this is this is more uh, of, 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 a, of a, an anomaly. It's, it's, it's not the, the common practice. Uh, one because it's a little more expensive, but I like to show it because it 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 gives some uh, some idea to the resiliency of what can happen during a storm or during uh, you know a, a crisis. You know, propane can can be moved around quite easily on a truck and fill fill vehicles too. Uh, and the, the next part is actually some temporary fueling. Um, I did work with a fleet in uh, in in the, in the Charlotte, uh, North Carolina area uh, where. Uh, you know, and it was Roush vehicles being delivered, and they got them there so quick. Um, uh, they they got there before the infrastructure was built. Now, granted, uh, a lot of the permitting got slowed down because of COVID, and nobody was in the office, so the the permit applications sat for a couple of months before they got they got processed. Uh, but then the fuel provider brought a temporary refueling site out uh, that allowed them to 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 get all their 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 vehicles done. But this is not ideal either. Either. Um, the next slide will show the the on-site in your parking lot. Um, I'm sorry, this is another uh, temporary refueling picture, but this is the on-site in your uh, facility uh, where you have your own fuel station, and uh, and this is where we like to shine um, because we can do it very inexpensively and, uh, and 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 relatively quickly, and it's very scalable. Uh, I have some other pictures of, of some on-site, what it, what it might look like in the next couple. <clears throat> if you could just kind of scroll through those for me, Rachel. And uh, you can see that, you know, you can have a 1,000 tank, you can have a two 1,000s. In the next slide, you could actually put two 2,000s end-to-end -end with dispensers so you can have two buses filling up at the same time. It's very flexible. And, uh, and very scalable. The same dispensers that are pumping 10 gallons a minute, you know, 24 hours a day, um, you could just put additional tanks in behind it uh, to keep the volumes up, depending on how fast you grow your fleet. Uh, we can even get into some very large ones um, that when you're, when you're doing four, five, 600 buses, like some of the school districts down in Texas are doing, you can see the, the tanks in these next pictures are you know 18 and 30,000 gallon tanks and uh, and still you have some relatively low costs for doing this and uh, and and Matt and other uh, propane uh, retailers uh, love love to work out arrangements for that now if if you're not in the in the in the position where you have to go outside of your your fueling infrastructure uh, like you're seeing in some of these pictures here. Um, you can actually go online and see the DOE station locator. 
uh, and I use this all the time on my phone, uh, the image on the left uh, of this next slide is actually going to show pin dots where you actually can uh, find propane you know, on, your, on your phone app, or you can do the web application and do beginning to end. Uh, before I before I show that though, we should probably talk a little bit about the cost on this, and I'll back up one slide, Rachel. I know I'm I'm uh, taking you everywhere here, but just to give you an idea, that that first little single, you know, from one to fifty vehicle equipment needed uh, for dispensing propane is about forty thousand dollars when you're doing the uh, uh, the the fuel management, you know, uh, portion of it there as well. And if you wanted to do, you know, 10 CNG with some time fill overnight, you're going to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars and up to a quarter million dollars for the same uh, 10, 10 buses or 10 shuttles with uh, EV fast charging. The best part about propane is, is that same infrastructure can be used, you know, even when you go up to doing hundreds of vehicles at a time. But that DOE station locator is always great to have on a, on a driver's phone in this next slide where you can just uh, put in propane and, and then it'll give you all of the dots. This happens to be, you know, one I was doing in, in Chicago. And then you can go right there and you can get all the information on it. But all those purple dots add up to about 3,500 different public fueling stations. And my favorite today is actually the one Matt built in Binghamton. Uh, so Matt, why why did you why did you build this one? Tell us the story behind this one. Yeah, sure thing, Steve. I appreciate that, and a lot of lot of very helpful and useful resources um, that are available. Um, so what happened? I think this was back in 2018. Uh, Binghamton University, local SUNY school, um, you know, in the southern tier of New York State, is um, looking to clean up their fleet. Their fleet that they're looking to clean up is um they call it occt that's the off-campus college transportation this is um transportation for binghamton university students um that's going to take them from campus to various points off-campus student housing um downtown um lecture halls that they've gotten they've they've kind of outgrown their facility which a lot of colleges tend to do um uh, that they occupy currently the traditional footprint and they've started to expand and, and, and branch out to to different areas of the local community so in order to get students from a to b they've they had developed this program uh quite a few years back but they're now recently um uh in the hopes of cleaning it up a little bit and using a cleaner burning fuel with uh, less maintenance costs and they landed on propane so originally their idea was, and I think it was your first example that you had shown, Steve, with regard to on-site fueling, uh, spray filling, we'll call it, um, those in the propane industry would be really familiar with, um, where they would want us to come on site and to dispense fuel right into the buses directly. Um, not the ideal situation by any means. You know, we want to minimize the number of product transfers um, just because there's the more product transfers you have, the you know more chances for something to go awry, right? But um, so we, in collaboration with the university, uh, talked about what about a refueling facility? And at that time, they weren't interested in it because currently, uh, at the time, they were refueling their diesel-powered buses off-site at, uh, let's say, gas station or convenience store locations. Um, the company that I work for, Moravito Energy, we operate over 110 convenience stores as well. I primarily reside on the, the energy side of the business with fuel distribution. Um, the convenience store group, they've got a lot of real estate out there. They've got a lot of good-sized parking lots, a lot of places that you can maneuver buses into that are coming into to currently uh, fuel up with traditional fuels such as diesel fuel and gasoline. So we had put a plan together for a site that's very close to the university within the majority of their routes that they run um, at a at one of our convenience stores. Existing location had plenty of real estate uh, space, you know, out uh, to the to the uh, to the side of the building where you could um, install a a larger tank. Um, I believe it's a 6,500 gallon tank and a auto gas dispenser, the one that we're looking at here on the left hand side, that can be used um, by not just the university and their bus fleet, but also by the public. This dispenser in particular will take any type of credit card that is, um, you know, any major credit card to take and also our proprietary fuel card, which that's what the folks at Binghamton University use to fuel their buses. Um, 
So we entered into a, I believe it's a, it was a longer term agreement to, um, to build this infrastructure. Um, as at that point, we had no one looking for propane to, to uh, run vehicles down the road with the hopes that, okay, we'll start this here. We'll start with this uh, entity and we'll build from that and we'll go and then recruit other people to consume auto gas and propane as a motor fuel um, for those purposes. Of those other people are our fleet, right? The units that we run, that we operate most notably, and um, I believe Derek, it would, uh, would be the Ford F-550s we use for our propane installation trucks. We've got um, three of those that we just brought online recently and a couple of which will be stationed out of this area to be able to use and consume this uh, propane as a motor fuel. So um, that there's a bunch of other municipal fleets that are around. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely um, the volumes that they've been able to consume out of here uh out of the out of recent year well this most notably last year have decreased a bit just due to pandemic related issues um so the first year they were students on campus to, to move that's around the, i mean that's understandable they sent them home yeah they sent them home during the beginning of the pandemic and then when they did when they did come back they isolated them to the dorm rooms and they were doing they were on campus, but they were doing remote learning while on campus. So um, every school, I'm sure, had their own strategy. But um, year over year, 18 to 19, uh, from the school year 2018-19 to 1920, the volume was up 25%. The number of units that they were operating were, I believe they were three units in the or the initial units that came online in 2018. They had plans to substitute all um, the diesel units at a pace of three units per year every other year until they're full propane. The, uh, the folks at the transportation group at the university really enjoy these vehicles. Actually, the students that operate these vehicles prefer to jump in the propane ones over the diesel ones um, just because there's not as much noise and the, uh, you know, they don't walk out of the thing smelling like exhaust when they're going into uh, their next lecture hall when they're able to do that at a socially distant space. Um, but yeah, it's been a really great partnership. They, it's, and you know we talk about the ease of use of a dispenser like this at a public facing facility again the students are operating these buses that are transporting other students around so the students are the ones that are bringing the buses over to refill them so you've got a college student that has to go get a cdl uh, license to be able to operate one of these units and they're out there being able to pump propane from you know this dispensing unit into those buses simple to use um, it's a great option to have um, I just need to move more gallons through it and keep some of those uh, 19 billion gallons of exported propane here domestically. So we continue hey, to find more and more ways. Now, Matt, I, I love it. There you go. With everybody gotta, on this. We got to keep that BTU yeah. here. That's that's <laughs> for sure. But no, it's it's been a great story. I mean, it's been a great um, it's been a great option to have, and you know, we were really fortunate to be able to to offer it to the university and to do some collaborative work with. Um, I know, Jacob, you're, you operate with Clean Cities of Capital District. We collaborated with Barry Carr out of the um, clean, clean Communities of Central New York chapter. So that was, you know, that was all instrumental in getting this thing done and, you know, being able to, to get some of that funding that's out there available to putting infrastructure projects like this together. Well, we are going to talk about some funding, but uh, right after we hear from the star of the show, that's right. So is that uh, is that all for the infrastructure piece, Stephen, Matt? It is. That's great. I think so, yes. That's great. I, it's, um, I think it's, uh, you know, good that, you know, you guys really showed kind of the, the flexibility and the, the amount of different options that a fleet really has uh, when it comes to the propane infrastructure, right? And, and it kind of seems like... Um, you know, there's a solution for every kind of scenario and you can kind of start off uh, maybe with the, the spray feeling that you mentioned and then slowly work into kind of a, a more uh, permanent solution uh, like we see here at Binghamton. So uh, that's great. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. And thanks again, Steve. Uh, now we're going to pass it over to Amy Selak with Hunter Tannersville Central School District. And uh, we're going to kind of hear the real boots on the ground story from Amy as the uh, uh, transportation manager for their school bus fleet. So, Amy, take it away. I, I think you might be on mute, Amy.
How about now? Perfect. Loud and clear. Okay, good. Thank you. A little bit of history on how I got started. I started as a bus driver. So I drove a bus for about 10 years and then I got the opportunity to move into the supervisor's position. And I had a very close relationship with my students and, and as I was getting ready to transition into being a supervisor, I would ask them, what do you want to see different? And, you know, it went from a range of we want, you know, shorter bus rides to uh, we want a warmer bus to we want to not smell the bus before it gets there. So um, before I had started, I had actually gone around and purposely and, and interviewed the senior class to what they could remember about their transportation and what they wanted to see improving. And I get much the same responses. So when I started, I hit the ground running. My first presentation to the Board of Education that had just hired me was, I have a great idea. And I wasn't as received <laughs> well as I wanted to be at the time because of all the same fallacies about changing an engine and changing a transmission and changing the way we fuel, the Board of Education went, no, 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 you can't do that, you just started. Um, so I went to my dealership and I, I asked for information and I asked for help and New York Bus Sales and Bluebird came with everything. And my next presentation was cost effectiveness and how we can make the transition to propane easily and uh, there would be no, there would be no uh, hold up to it. Um, I'm having some technically difficulties right this instant. Are you still with me? We can still hear you. I, okay. Yep. I don't know. I think my my phone went off and it blocked out my screen. So I'm just going to keep talking. Um. So I, I actually began supervising my friends, which wasn't so easy, but I got them on board. And our first propane bus arrived in 2016. Yes, 2000, now 2014, I lied. And uh, everybody was very hesitant, you know, as a driver, anything new is concerning and um, how are we gonna fuel it? And how am I going to, um, stop myself from blowing up. I don't know why they thought that, but they did. Um, so we had all kinds of training on how to fuel it. And by the end of the first year, I had heard things like, wow, that, that's really easy. Um, gosh, I didn't know it was gonna be so easy. Um, we train every driver for three hours before they can drive a propane so that they have all of the different facets of the changes between diesel and propane and even between diesel, propane and gas, because we have all three vehicles on our fleet. I live in a uh, rural district that is 165 square miles. I have 13 bus drivers, nine bus runs, the longest one being 247 miles. Um, the 247 mile bus run is being used by with a propane and that driver loves it. When you are driving such a long distance, your students are usually having a lovely conversation in the back. And when you're driving a diesel, especially when you're going up a hill, you can't hear anything that those students are until there's a, a fight, until somebody stands up and tells you, you know, so-and-so is touching me or whatever the problem is. And the driver came back within the first couple of months and said, I can tell you what Sally had for breakfast yesterday. I can tell you that her mother grounded her last week and she really hates her math teacher. And she sat in the last seat of a, second to last seat of a 40 foot vehicle. So that was good to hear. Um, I, I would say that my drivers have 100% acclimated to the propane program. I have six out of 10 full size vehicles in propane. Uh, I would love to have them all in propane. I find that now the chief complaint is in the middle of February when it's negative 10 degrees, the driver is saying the heat comes on so fast and it's just so hot. How can I turn it down? Which is definitely not what you hear from a driver that's driving a diesel bus in negative 10 weather. Um, I remember when I was going up through school, 
we had um, our school was set down below with the driveway above. So from our school windows, you couldn't really see the buses, but you could see this cloud of smoke. So I think that our school district, we can now pull up right next to the building if we had to, which we we don't, we're about 10 feet away. And if I had to keep the buses running due to negative 10 degrees, there is a feeling of safety and that we're not intoxicating the whole school. Um, I would say that the staff is is 100% on. And as a matter of fact, I have two more uh, buses arriving in September and it is now March of the previous years. I don't even think the, the budget has gone through and I know the vote hasn't gone through. Um, my school district is very supportive of our buses, so the drivers are con convinced that they're going to have it. And I've already gotten three requests. Oh, the new bus is coming, and it's it's a propane. I uh, my new bus is going, so I thought maybe I would get the new one. So it's kind of funny to see. Um, we're going to continue with propane, and I believe that um, I'm going to keep pushing to get at least 90% of the the fleet covered. I'm not sure if there's any questions. I'm not sure if you're still with me. We're still with you, Amy. Oh, we're here with you, Amy. That's, so, that's great. I just wanted to see the rest of the images there. Yeah, that's great. And I mean, I, I think really that those driver testimonies kind of speak, uh, you know, really speak to kind of the, the quality of, of the fuel and, um, you know, I'm sure there's, there may be times where they're hearing things in the back of the bus that uh, they might not want to be hearing, but um, yeah, I, I mean, that, that's great. And again, anyone uh, with any questions for Amy, uh, feel free to put them in, in the questions pod. Um, if there's nothing else right now, I, I'm going to go finish up with a, with a quick few slides on uh, funding opportunities and um, then we can wrap up with any questions if, if there are any. So thanks again, Amy. Uh, appreciate kind of the, the firsthand experience with the fuel. Um, so um, as I mentioned before, there, there are some uh, New York State incentives available uh, for the purchase of, of propane vehicles. Uh, the, that program being the New York State Truck Voucher Incentive Program and uh, that's managed by uh, NYSERDA, New York State Department of Transportation, and uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation. So if you go to the next slide, Rachel. Uh, so the, uh, you know, the TVIP, as, as we call it for short, um, is really kind of funded through a combination of uh, funding pots. And one of those is, is the uh, Federal Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Improvement Program, or CMAC. Um, and then the other funding pot is the Volkswagen settlement money um, that I'm, I'm sure many of us have heard about uh, in the past. So in particular for the uh, propane vehicles, class four through eight propane school buses and trucks, uh, those vehicle types are both funded through uh, the Volkswagen settlement portion of the money. So um, although the, the, the voucher program is kind of uh, branded as, as one program, uh, depending on the vehicle class and the vehicle type, uh, that money may be coming from a different source and that may affect the, the eligibility requirements. But as for propane, those are both coming from the Volkswagen settlement money piece. Um, so here is kind of just a, a quick summary of what the uh, the proposed uh, incentives are for propane. And so uh, for both trucks and school buses, uh, it's up to 90% of the incremental cost compared to the diesel uh, equivalent. And uh, for trucks, uh, up to $60,000 for a class eight propane truck. Um, and on the school bus side of things, uh, throughout the, the class scale, um, funding of, of a $10,000 uh, cap uh, is limited. Um, so 90% of the incremental costs up to $10,000. And as Steve had shown in the past, uh, that $10,000 uh, would would cover the average kind of difference between a propane and diesel bus um, uh, based on what's out there today. Uh, next slide, Rachel. So um, as with uh, any state and federal kind of incentive programs, uh, there's a number of of requirements and, and eligibility conditions. Um, 
so f for the the TVIP, um, it's open for all commercial, non-profit, and uh, public and private sector fleets. Um, however, if uh, uh, federal uh, vehicle fleets are not eligible, so um, you know there is one exception to that. Um, vehicles that are purchased through the the truck voucher program must be operated and registered within New York State boundaries for at least five years after uh, after purchase. Um, so really um, kind of limits that to uh, fleets that are domiciled uh, in New York State. Um, and you know one of the big requirements uh, that we see here is that um, you know uh, to take advantage of the voucher, program uh, a existing diesel vehicle with a diesel engine model year 1992 to 2009 uh, must be retired and scrapped uh, for every new propane vehicle purchased. Um, and on top of that, uh, to ensure that um, it is actual uh, existing fleet vehicles that are um, on the road uh, for propane um, or for trucks, uh, the vehicle that is scrapped uh, must have had at least 5,000 miles traveled the previous two years. Um, and for buses, the requirement is that the bus uh, that is scrapped must have at least 2,500 miles traveled uh, annually over the previous two years. So um, that kind of makes sure that uh, the vehicle that is scrapped must be uh, on the road in an existing fleet vehicle, not necessarily something that might have been uh, sitting in the yard for a couple of years. So uh, there are uh, kind of a, a number of additional funding requirements and um, you know caveats to the funding that are all outlined on NYSERDA's website, but uh, these kind of three points are the main ones uh, uh, that should be kind of noted up front. Uh, next slide, please, Rachel. Um, as of now, uh, the uh, NYSERDA has uh, periodically publishes a list of eligible vehicles and eligible contractors to be purchased from. And as of now, there are uh, about 18 different uh, propane models that are on the existing eligible vehicle list. Uh, and that includes the Bluebird Vision uh, 3011 and 3303 school buses, um, as well as a variety of different Roush cleantech options. Um, as well. So, um, you know, although that these are the propane vehicles that are um, on the eligible vehicles list today, um, if there are other vehicles out there that a particular fleet is interested in, um, NYSERDA can work uh, directly with the dealership uh, to then, you know, get them certified as an eligible contractor and get the particular vehicle in question certified as an eligible vehicle as well. Uh, but there may, may be more steps involved in that process. Um, so I guess just wanted to point out that, uh, you know, the list of vehicles that they do publish is not set in stone. Uh, it can be added to. Um, so that's all I have on the funding side of things. Uh, but again, I uh, want to encourage everyone to uh, open up with any questions on any of the pre presentations, if you have any. Um, and so I'm... I'm kind of filtering through the question pod right now and I, I don't see anything. Um, I've got a question. There was one question, Jacob, oh. that, that came in that I, that I addressed uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a written response. It was about, um, you know, the, uh, the, the companies that make auto gas dispensers. And, uh, and, I, and I do, I, I have about six, um, you know, that, that are UL certified and, and they also have to do weights and measures. I mean, so they're, they're all good to go and I'd be happy to share those. Um, so I've, I've got my email address that I've, that I've posted in the answer. So um, any, anybody who has, uh, has need of, of that, I'd be glad to, to go ahead and send it to them. But I think everybody did a great job, a very thorough job uh, of, of uh, presenting their information. And I just want to thank you again, Jacob, for having me and uh, and for, for everyone else. Oh, look at that. We have contact information for everybody. Um, <clears throat> Thanks, Steve. And I, I had a few closing remarks, too. I wanted to, again, thank all of our presenters uh, for all the great information. Um, I've certainly even learned a lot on the call today. So. Um, I'm, I'm always happy to say that, and um, 
always good to, to walk away from these with knowing more than you started with. Um, I also wanted to point out, I, I posted a couple kind of uh, useful links in the chat pod. So as, as everyone might be leaving here today, I encourage you to kind of take a look at these. Uh, the first one is uh, actual, uh, uh, a virtual fleet visit that uh, the Clean Communities Coalition did with some of our local stakeholders, um, Mulhern Gas Company and Precision Auto Gas, uh, who's a, uh, an auto gas biofuel upfitter in the region. Uh, so we went and took a, lo a look at their facility and some of their vehicles that they're using um, and did kind of a, a quick five minute video on, on the benefits of the fuel and the technology. Uh, so I encourage everyone to take a look at that. Um, I also have posted a, a link directly to NYSERDA's website uh, for a little bit more information on the truck voucher program. But um, I also encourage anyone on the call, uh, if that's of interest to you, to reach out directly to me and we can maybe talk through uh, uh, your particular fleet and vehicles. Um, and then also, you know, kind of put you in contact with uh, someone directly at NYSERDA that would uh, kind of be able to help you walk through that process um, a little more. And finally, uh, Steve mentioned the alternative fuel station locator, uh, a Department of Energy tool uh, that I find extremely helpful in, in all uh, kind of aspects of my duties here as the <laughs> coalition coordinator as well. Um, and I think that is a, a very useful tool for anybody interested um, in alternative fuels, it's it's very comprehensive. Uh, you can pull out data sets into um, Excel format and and manipulate them later. So definitely uh, take a look at that if you're interested more in uh, the public infrastructure side of things as well. So uh, that's all I have for for closing remarks. I think we're we're just over the the two thirty timeline. So again, thank you everyone for being here and. Um, keep an eye out for a follow-up email with uh, the webinar recording and presentations and, and all of our uh, additional resources. So thanks again, everyone. And thank you, thank Perk, you. for being thank a you. part of this.